Hey guys, welcome to Cinematographs. This is my series where I spend the whole month watching films of a similar theme, then ranking and discussing them. This month we have Latin American cinema, which if there's any region of film I'm unfamiliar with, it's this one. But that's what this video is for, so here we have 13 different films, and a quick disclaimer that this is Latin American cinema, but I chose films that were in Spanish because I'm trying to improve my Spanish listening skills for an upcoming thing I have. So that's why a big film industry like Brazil isn't on here, with the exception of City of God, because I feel like I have to watch that one right now. Some films I'm going to refer to by their Spanish title, some I'm going to refer to by their English title. It just depends on what letterbox has them as because I'm assuming that's their most popular name. As always, this will be in order from worst to best, and you can check the description to see the names of all the films I watched this month. Los Olvidados is about a group of troubled kids in the slums of Mexico, the way they all keep each other down, and how they get lost in the rest of the world. I thought the film was okay. In regards to films touching on the subject matter, I much prefer something like The 400 Blows, or even some of the other Latin American films I watched this month. And that's not me trying to boil it down to something simple, but with this film, it's hard for me to shake that old movie feel to it. It reminds me of American post-war noir, which is one of my least favorite genres or styles. I think the bleak atmosphere combined with the fact that nothing particularly happens that piques my interest made this a tough one to get through. However, I can appreciate some of the choices or creative liberties taken in the film, such as the dreamy surrealist scene. But if you're watching this and love this film, please tell me why because I just want to see if there's something I'm completely missing. It just seems like a film that paved the way for more to come, not a masterpiece in itself. I think it's something that looks good on paper but lacks in the watching experience. <laughs> No, in its form, is one of the unique films on this list because it's recorded in a video style, which works because it makes you feel more involved with what's going on, like you've uncovered some secret footage. And in a way, that's what the film is. I wouldn't say I was ever really bored of No, but I felt the narrative starting to become very face value. It really is just focused on telling a story related to a pivotal historical event, and it is interesting. The film and its characters feel very real, and I'm actually glad I watched it because I learned something new. As a film though, there's nothing there blowing me away. It's very much just a simple, pleasant watch, and surprisingly one of the lightest from this month. But when I compare everything else to this, I don't see it as remotely on the same level. Embrace of the Serpent feels like something that is suppressed, which makes sense given that it shows these two different sides while leaning into the world of one, that being indigenous culture in the Amazon. It touches on the effects of the West and assimilation towards one of the most underrepresented groups in the media. But I think what makes the film more tragic is that it doesn't try to tell you anything. It just shows you these characters, this setting, and two journeys, and there's a lot to take in. And you don't take it in all at once. You understand it bit by bit as the film progresses. Because these types of things like loss of culture just happen and life continues on without anyone there to be a moral compass. There's something hollow in its mood, like it's a film that wants to say something but isn't allowed to. Really just a classic story. Not in the way that the narrative is common or whatever, but in the way that the film is just a good movie. There isn't anything experimental or changing the game, but there's nothing wrong with it. You watch it, you have fun with it, and then you move on with it, especially because this is like one of two stories here that has a happy ending. I enjoy heist type scheming films a lot, and I honestly feel like this is something I would have watched when I was younger and find it to be a piece of my childhood when I was older, if that makes sense. <laughs> Tu Mama Tambien is such an easy watch. I'm a sucker for coming of age stories, but especially group dynamics, and these three are such explosive personalities that it's hard to look away from. They have such great chemistry together, bringing the script to life. It all feels very real, and I get the sense that the film has bottled up and presented a heightened version of life very beautifully. It's energetic, striking, and just a great story with a lot of heart. You feel very involved with the journey and attached to the characters. It doesn't take place over a long period of time, so once you're out of that fever dream towards the end, the trip feels like an open book, like there's something that you're missing. And then those last few moments of the film hit, and it's as if that chapter is finally closing. You just sit there like, dang, and you feel empty but not overly sad. Because somehow it happens in a very natural, life-being-life way. I can't do much with what the film gives me, but I certainly feel a lot lighter after finishing it. 
I was extremely moved by and in awe of Nostalgia for the Light. I've never really sat down and looked at documentaries before, but this surprised me by a long shot. The two things it compares, astronomy and archaeology, of seemingly unrelated things are so well articulated in the film and I never in a million years would have connected the two. I wasn't sure what I was watching in the first 20 to 30 minutes, but I think that mystery needed to be present because it makes the, I guess, reveal of what the documentary is about that much more of a sucker punch to the gut. And the words of the people being interviewed are so just beautiful. I'm serious, there's so many lines that I could pick out from this that got me good and it's so raw and emotional and you can easily feel that coming from the people speaking. It's a haunting documentary about the past and the present and the effects of the Pinochet dictatorship on Chile. It really just is so depressing and at first unassuming and I'm not sure how you can finish watching something like this and not rethink your own life for at least a couple of minutes. Hello darkness. A 12-year night follows three prisoners over 12 years after a military dictatorship takes over. Out of the films on this list, I think it's one of the best demonstrations of the psychological effect dictatorships and war have on people. It acts like a portrait, keeping you within this box of solitude among the prisoners. And the tone there is very drained, so whenever one of the characters thinks back to the past and a more innocent version of themselves to seek out that comfort, you feel the importance of it as well. That can be attributed to the editing, from the little jump cuts in one scene, to the bigger choices made of cross-cutting between two wildly different scenes. And there's also the score, which is almost inspiring for lack of a better word. I think the film just feels like a rare, poetic gem that captures humanity well in all its good and bad. Roma feels like something that Alfonso Cuaron, since the moment he decided to become a filmmaker, knew he was going to do. It's an ode to his childhood and it feels nostalgic, even to me, someone who's never remotely been in the same places as anyone in this film. It's like he's giving you a hug through it. You can tell that Cuaron has a lot of love for Mexico and Mexico City, while at the same time harboring some criticism for its politics. It's a very sad duality shown through a character who I believe is meant to represent the average experience of a housekeeper in a Mexican household during this time, which is why Cleo is never really fleshed out as a character. On a technical level, Roma is very slow in the way it moves, like with the camera movements and how long it holds on its shots. It reminds me a lot of Ozu, that meditative approach he has to his films. And the shots are so beautiful. There's a full dynamic range of sound that sticks out from the very beginning and adds to the atmosphere in the film. It's a very great and special watch. On paper, I can never explain this film to someone. It blows my mind how Nyarathu was able to accomplish something like this with how long-winded and complex the story is, and not even counting the fact that dogs are somehow in every aspect of it. I've mentioned this on the channel before, but I am a sucker for intersecting storylines. And this is slightly different because each couple's perspective is in their own section of the film, not cross-cutting between all of them, but I still appreciate what is being done here. It's all cleverly put together, and and it feels like with the editing and score, the film knows exactly how and when to get a hold on you. It seriously had its claws dug into me for three hours straight. The characters are striking, but it's what happens to them that's even more brutal. It's insane the change they go through from beginning to end. They aren't even recognizable by then. There's so many layers, and I could imagine that if I watched it again and again, I would still notice new things each time. Everything about the film screams bold. <laughs> Dan's Labyrinth, I feel, is just something anyone can pick up and enjoy. There's a lot to appreciate about it, from its demonstration of magical realism to its ability to suck you into what feels like a fairy tale. The cinematography is beautiful, though I don't need to be the millionth person to ever say that. It's slightly shallower in its social commentary than the others, but that's because it lands on this balance where if you want to dig deeper into the film, you can, but if not, you're still left with a good experience that keeps you on its feet. There's a reason this film gets as much praise as it does, and it's warranted. It feels like a classic that will never be worn down by time. 
This one is definitely a little wild, I would say. The Secret in Their Eyes is probably one of the best crime thrillers I've ever seen. It knows exactly when to give you some information, when to not, keeping you on the edge of your seat the whole time. There's so many different twists and turns the film takes you through, and just when you think everything is all said and done, there's more. It balances a bunch of different themes and ideas at once, like the way both the murder case and an unforgotten love haunt Benjamin's memory. These very dark narratives are cleverly pieced together and held by strong performances and dialogue. It ironically is a film that I can remember clearly, probably the one that I can remember the most actually. City of God is one of the best films I've seen and definitely one of the most unique. I mean, if you just look at the editing or listen to the score or look at this clip, you can understand why. The style is so distinct and that is made clear from the very beginning. It reminds me a lot of La Haine, not just in themes, but also in the way it's constantly moving with an intense hold on its audience. I felt like I got on a train that did not stop for two hours. But City of God, in my opinion, is a lot more unforgiving than La Haine. There's cruelty rooted all the way through the entirety of the film, a sense that things may never improve. It's packed and it goes through multiple lives, cleverly telling different experiences within the same town. Nothing is ever sure or safe and there's more tension present than not. The characters are without a doubt memorable for whatever reason that may be. It's just a whirlpool of a film and brilliantly put together. When I was first watching City of God, I thought there was going to be nothing else this month that topped it. So imagine my surprise when I watch this film and I am just dead inside. The official story is so unassuming and understated. By the end of it, I was devastated. There's little details here and there, realizations that you as a viewer may have before the people in the film do. The performances add more to what was already a great script and a great story. Everything really adds more to it. Not to mention, it moved really quickly for me. I was watching and the next thing I knew the film was halfway over. And you know, I don't think this is better than City of God, but I like it more. It really just made me sad. It feels very real and a part of that may be due to the fact that somewhere in Argentina it is real. City of God somewhat glorified the violence in the area it was in, but the official story does nothing but question. And these are hard questions too, the complex ones that deal with morality and they stay unanswered. Okay, so that was my March 2024 watch list. Compared to the other videos in the series I've done, the films here also covered a larger range of topics, but that's probably because I didn't restrict this one to only one director or time period. I think there were two things that stuck out to me from this very broad selection of films. First, the films from Argentina. I don't know, I really liked the stories there and how they were handled, so I'd like to look into Argentinian cinema more. Second, the way a lot of the films addressed war and government. The stories were very raw and unfiltered, and they felt like either open wounds or scars that had yet to heal. And a lot of them also feel very alive alongside that, and so energetic and dynamic. There's a lot of movies here that I wish people talked about more because of that. Overall, a really good month, though very tonally different than what I'm used to. But I'm still glad that I got to see all of the films on this list. 